Hey guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Dr. Tom LeHue and we're going to be looking at Enneagram Type 5s today. And we're going to be looking at the thought, uh, you know, the story of your life. And this information comes from this book called Deep Living by Dr. Roxanne Howe Murphy. It's a really good book. I would recommend it. It's, you know, it's pretty substantial. And uh, it's designed for like helping each type figure out what growth looks like or what, you know, their path forward might look like. And so just a reminder in the description below is a link to my website, TomLahue.com. I do offer Enneagram and relationship coaching, think like marriage coaching based on the Enneagram. You know, it's a great tool to help us know more about ourselves, but also to help us live in relationships with the people that we love. Has your relationship gotten difficult? Uh, do you spend more time in silence or arguing than really connecting? Um, or maybe you just need help, like you feel stuck in life. Uh, I'm here for you. Just look at my website, Tom LeHue, reach out to me. I'd love to work with you. And I uh, also have a lot of different on-demand courses, and sometimes I offer courses live on Zoom. I'd love for you to take advantage of those. Okay, so let's jump into the information today. And, you know, with... With most of these uh, other types, I read and then I talk a lot. That's kind of what I do, it's kind of my thing. And I get the feeling with fives, like maybe it would be better to just kind of stay with the information on the page and maybe not give as much of my own input. I don't know, we'll see what happens, if, if I can control that or not. Uh, you know, I do have a son, let's start by saying, I do have a son, an 18 year old son, who's a five wing four. So, uh, and my dad, I think, was a five, wing six. So I do have some experience living with and interacting with fives. Uh, I know I could never, you know, completely understand what it's like to live in that five world, but I do, by observation, have some understanding. So let's uh, take a look at the information. And uh, I'm starting here in page 183. And she talks about uh, the story of your life. And so it's just kind of like this mythical story about what it might have been like for you growing up. And I don't want you to take too much out. I don't want to, I don't want you to make too much out of this and, you know, argue with every point um, or say, well, I don't know that I agree with that. Just maybe just hear it, just hear it and then evaluate it and see if any of it resonates with you. At the end, she does have some kind of challenge and let's, okay, let's jump into it. I'm already t talking too much. As a little child, you were exceptionally curious, intrigued by specific things that you could spend hours uh, on by yourself trying to understand how all these things worked. You were very sensitive to the energy of others. You know, the idea of like people being too loud or too demanding or too demonstrative. And it was easy to feel overwhelmed by this high level of activity and all this talking and all this emotional energy that was in your home environment. I gotta imagine what this might have been like for my son because you know there's four sisters and then mom and dad and sometimes for a while we had grandparents living with us and cats and dogs and you know all the friends of those sisters you know at our house all the time. I imagine that he very much did feel this way. By the way I did read this uh, to my son Harrison and asked, I read all of this to him and asked him, what do you think about it? He's like, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, it was hard to know how you fit in your family, um, how to feel safe in such a confusing environment. The only place that you ever really felt safe was in your own mind or in your own thoughts. And there was so much to figure out in the world and so much to understand that it felt like you would never have enough time to be able to do all of that figuring out. Thus it felt natural for you to retreat into your mind where you could find a safe and interesting haven. Here you would not be rejected. I wonder about that. I wonder if that said perfectly or I wonder if it stated a little too strong. Like, do you really have a fear of being rejected? I don't know, I mean, it would be interesting to talk about that. You know, is the fear one of being rejected or of being um, you know, too obligated to others or, um, I don't know. Interesting. Maybe put some comments down below. Even as a small child, you may have felt that there was no space for you in your family. And if all the places at the table were taken, I think this is interesting because I think nines often describe, you know, this as their experience growing up, that there was just, they weren't allowed to take up too much space or to be, you know, an imposition on others. It's interesting because nines often 
give space to people and allow people to sort of have the space to work through their problems. It's interesting that it's said that way about fives as well. Um, you continue to seek safety and solace in your mind and the more emotionally intense your environment, the more you would retreat from experiencing uh, those emotional demands and your own emotions and personal needs. Perhaps you sensed that your parents wanted more from you. Now, I know this is true because I'm a seven, my wife's a two, and I know we put a lot of pressure on our son this way. You may have heard things like, come on, let's make sure you meet some new friends, or you need to be more outgoing, uh, you need to be more active or involved with others. You know, you need to be friendly and say hello and be nice and all those kinds of things, right? Although you yearn for your parents' love, you really wanted to be left alone to figure things out and that didn't seem acceptable, or that seemed like it was a problem or an imposition on others. You felt that you didn't have enough energy to do everything that seemed expected of you, and so you conserved whatever energy you have or had. Rather than participate, you'd rather observe. Your strong imagination created intense anxieties about yourself and about the world and the dark scenarios that might happen in the future. You did not expect much from others except to just be left alone. And it's as if you said, I won't expect much out of you if you won't expect much out of me. And this helped you keep your distance from other people um, and from maybe even emotional closeness or nurturing that other people might provide in your life. You came to organize your life around the idea that the only way to really be safe or maybe the only way to really show up was by being in your head and by being smart and by being intelligent and being creative. You might, uh, your mind was the basis for your self-confidence. Now it's important to remember when we read further here that, that we remember that five is one of the competency types, you know, five, three, and one, they're all in this group together that they are people that need to feel competent. Like they need to feel knowledgeable, you know, like an expert in something. Threes need to feel fantastic, like they've accomplished a lot. Ones that they're diligent and responsible. But I think that's important going forward because a lot's going to be said about this. What you did not see is that you have the capacity to live in the world and to take action to reach your goals. And, you know, you, you have enough energy and resources to be engaged and also to be engaged with your own heart and the sweetness that's in your own heart. Now, I'm going to skip down a little bit. She talks about your great loss. Um, you know, how uh, you, you can sort of get stuck in this spiral of tackling, analyzing, memorizing, storing information. But, you know, it's kind of also natural to maybe disappear from situations that feel too demanding on your energy or too demanding um, on you. And overanalyzing, you might disappear from active engagement. Um, and pull you away from other people and relationships and maybe even pull you away from your body or your heart or your emotions or your feelings, those kinds of things. Um, it's like being dumped off in a big unknowable world and there's no recognizable signpost to find your place in the world and it feels like the world is gonna overwhelm you. It's like being lost in a dark chaos of life. Now, this I think is really important. As you go a little further in this chapter, she talks about the core belief. And every type has this core belief that kind of drives them. And the way she says it, I think, is interesting. She says, for the person dominant in the five structure, the core belief is that there's no place for you in an unwelcoming, strange world and that you're on your own. You cannot rely on anyone else to explain what's going on your experience has been that any understanding you will receive will have to come through you. You feel an intense fear because everything around you feels so chaotic. So I've got to work out all these solutions to my life. Uh, if people just wouldn't expect so much of me. And interacting with people can be draining, overwhelming, and even scary. And then she has these three statements that are just fantastic. And I want you to like hear these and maybe think about them. She has like, I pursue, I avoid, and I cope. So those three things she does with every type. This is what she says. As a five, I pursue knowing more and being more knowledgeable in certain topics than anyone else. Sometimes fives, you know, you kind of get this feeling with fives like, 
It's not so much that they want information is that they want information that other people don't know or other people don't understand. Like they're drawn to the information that makes them stand out and be competent. I'm drawn to studying and understanding rare topics which escape the attention of most people. Seeking knowledge of the many details and intricacies of a topic is a way to feel masterful and competent. There it is. Okay, so competency type. Feeling like I know something. I understand something that other people don't know or understand. This could be, you know, baseball statistics. It could be how to split atoms, you know, in a nuclear lab. It could be, um, uh, you know, elect electric electricity. It could be anything. It could be Star Wars. It could be any topic. This knowledge becomes my contribution to others. This information, the sharing of knowledge or this knowing of this information and being the expert becomes my contribution to others. So I pursue the knowledge and information. I avoid experiences where I don't understand what's going on or I feel ignorant. Now, what do fives do to the rest of us? They sometimes make us feel like we don't understand and that we're ignorant. So they kind of like cast that fear out uh, to others. The thing that bothers them when they're upset with you or when they need to you know, maybe feel better about themselves, they kind of push that fear out on others. Why would I participate in activities or interactions that make no sense to me? Of course, I wouldn't. They would only deplete my energy and leave me feeling small and shaky. Or why would I give my attention and time to people that don't matter to me or to relationships I don't want to pursue or that feel vexing or toxic or overwhelming to me? And then this, I think, is the best part. I think this, if you stayed through this video till now, I, I hope that this you know, is as challenging to you. And I, again, I'm not a five. I'm just reading this and trying to understand it. But for you guys who are fives, I think you'll find this especially interesting and, you know, interact with it. Tell me what you think. I cope by going into my head to learn and analyze and understand and to recite. I handle my interactions by telling others what I know about a topic, um, which realize that doesn't always work for you, right? Sometimes people just want to talk to you about what's going on in your life and you're maybe seeing it as an opportunity to share information, which is what you're passionate about. And you kind of think everybody wants to know all this information when really they maybe don't. Maybe they just want a small talk and connect. They're talking to you because they want to connect or because they want to know more about you. Um, or they just feel anxious to have silence. And you know, you may use this as an opportunity to dump truck a lot of information on people and they may not necessarily respond to it in the way you think that they would. I handle interactions by telling others what I know about a topic. I minimize my emotional needs. So I'm an island under myself, I'm independent, I don't need anything from people. Re realize that's gonna make it hard for some people to connect with you because some people like type twos, for example, they look to find what needs people have and then they try to connect around those needs. And when you say, I don't, I don't want to have needs or I don't have needs, notice it may limit some people from being able to connect with you. And you may not even realize that's going on. I don't ask others for anything. Again, the never ever behavior for a five is never underestimate a five uh, because they're going to figure out how to get it done without all of the support and all of the resources from other people because they may want something back from me. I don't want to be obligated to other people. But notice, remember, okay, pause. I know I'm talking a lot, but that obligations that we have in relationships is what makes relationships, you know, dynamic. It's what makes relationships work is that there's a give and take. There's an exchange. And notice you kind of maybe without realizing it, I put yourself in a position where I don't need anything from you. And then it's like other people may want that obligation relationship. I know it feels, I don't know, maybe I'm not explaining it well, but okay. Uh, let me just keep, go back to the text. Um, I don't feel that I can give much energy to others because I would become depleted. I cope by putting all of my attention on my thinking. And there's more, it gets even better, okay? As an extension of my coping, I can see that my life is or has been organized around figuring things out and analyzing and becoming engrossed in ideas. If I can be an expert at understanding how specific things work, then life will feel more manageable to me. I don't want to put my ideas into action until I'm sure of the outcome. Remember that's that line to eight? Like when you feel like you know enough that it's time to take action, it's time to step up to the plate and use your knowledge to challenge others' assumptions or challenge others' belief systems, or to just 
create and uh, to, um, you know, to uh, affect change in your world, to accomplish. Uh, so it says, I don't want to put my ideas in action until I'm sure of the outcome. Notice it can be hard like, to turn in papers or dissertations, you know, or thesis because I, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like it's ever finished. I don't feel like I've got enough resources or enough information or I covered the topic enough. Okay, uh, I don't get, so I may not get around to implementation. So learning, 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 understanding and thinking through strategies and methods, but having a hard time like actually implementing and taking action. If I can only keep, if I can keep a distance from those human activities that make no sense to me, and if I can keep filling myself up with knowledge, I'll feel safe, at least for the moment. And all of this leads me to see myself as a smart, perceptive, observant person. This self-definition, this sense of self, ends up imposing limits on me. It keeps me from recognizing and appreciating the fuller range of my human experience. So, you know, I think probably a good question here, you know, at the end of this is, all right, so based on all this information, what do we do? Based on all this information, what changes should I make? Is there a problem in any of this? You know, is this just the way everybody should be? Everybody should be more like this. And yeah, to a degree, I think you're right. But what, what limitations does this bring into the way you interact in the world? What potential limitations could this cause or challenges could this cause to your relationships with other people, to your ability to affect change and to accomplish all of your goals. Think of it like this, you got all these goals in life, but sometimes your personality structure, as with all of us, your fundamental motivations and goals and impulses and compulsions of your type sometimes conflict with what you actually want to accomplish and what you really wanna have in life, whether it be relationships or whether it be outcomes at work, or whether it just be your dreams and plans for the kind of life that you want to live. Fascinating stuff. I know I don't fully understand it. And fives, um, you know, I'm trying. I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to make sense of it all. And uh, thank you for your comments and your encouragement. And uh, we're almost at 50,000 subscribers. So how about that? That's crazy. And I appreciate every one of you guys. And thank you for taking the time to check out this information. I hope it's helpful to you and challenging to you. And I hope it helps you see yourself maybe from an outsider's perspective um, so that, you know, we can lessen the damage that some of these impulses can cause in our life. They work for us, you know, 80% of the time, but 20% of the time our same impulses can can keep us from moving forward in life. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. Thanks for your, um, thanks for your, uh, your, your relationship, your connection, but I appreciate you. And as always be present to life. I'll see you next time.